<laughs> All right, we are live. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Colin, the flying mechanic. Uh, he's a instructor over at MTSU, you said? Yeah, Middle Tennessee State University. Middle Tennessee State University. Uh, he teaches uh, flying pi pilot courses and a little bit of uh, maintenance courses. Uh, he's a certified AMP IA. Yep. And uh, just kind of wanted to talk to him today about what inspired him to pursue aviation, both flying or as, or in the maintenance side, uh, what brought him to, to teaching, and uh, just kind of walk through, you know, his career over the years and, and uh, what kind of advice he's got for those of us that are on our way into the industry or uh, already here and looking at which way to go. Awesome. Uh, first off, I'd like to just say thanks, Madison, for inviting me and uh, working this out to where we could get together and have this discussion. I really uh, like the content that I see over on your channel, as well as the previous one that you did. Um, it, I thought it was really informative, and I think it's a great way of sharing some knowledge uh, from somebody who's not got a ton of experience, not got a ton of um, things beyond what someone interested in getting their AMP would have, but is he five, 10 years down the road of that individual and might have some recent uh, reflections of their process, the things that uh, helps them, the things that he, I would recommend. And um, so, yeah, I'm excited. I feel like this is a great opportunity and uh, really excited that it worked out to do this. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a, a fun journey. I've, I've really enjoyed corresponding with you on the back end of all this and kind of getting it rolling. Uh, I haven't been doing this very long. Uh, you know, I've, I've had my channel since COVID. I, I rebooted it because um, I started it while I was overseas as a, a, a government contractor uh, doing oh. helicopter work. And uh, I just wasn't a fan of my production quality and the information I, I had put out was outdated. So I thought, let me just give this a reboot and kind of see where it goes. And then I met Michael from Sailing Aviation and he kind of showed me through the steps of uh, starting my own independent business. And I've been doing some work recently. I've, I'm overhauling an uh, a, uh, A75 Continental. Oh, uh, nice. For, for a guy, Luscom 8A. And that's been an ordeal his uh his aircraft was um stc'd with the a75 and a, and a wing tank and on the back of that paper the amp wrote um that uh he he wrote it as an eight fox so i went through the airframe and it didn't seem like everything was was properly done and every piece of documentation after that still says eight alpha. And uh, so, so I've been trudging my way through that and talking with the FISDO and trying to get that all straightened out for him. And <laughs> FISDO basically said, as long as he doesn't crash and he's okay with the way the logbook is, it doesn't matter until it sells. <laughs> wow. Interesting. But also he, they, they're like, it's on you as the mechanic to, to straighten that up and, and him as the pilot to say, yes, let's get that done. So, Sure. That sounds super interesting. Putting an O200, but he doesn't want to spend the 40 grand on an O200. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <I can't see. laughs> I'm up against the TBO on my 140 engine. So I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do there. Um, yeah. I think I'm going to try to extend it as much as I can make a decision on the future of the aircraft as a whole. Mm -hmm. And, uh, really the next few years will decide what I end up doing with it. So we'll see. Yeah. So uh, I keep hearing mixed messages on, on TBOs for personally owned aircraft outside of like your sure. flight instruction and stuff. A lot of people are are asking me, does TBO really matter? I mean, it, for, for, for someone who's for someone's personal aircraft, should they care about the TBO? I feel like TBO is an informative benchmark. Mm -hmm. That's what I would refer to it as. Um, when I was doing aircraft maintenance at Middle Tennessee State University, what I did before I moved over into the instructional side of things, we routinely took our engines to 150, 180, 200% of TBO 
uh, with top overhauls as necessary, a cylinder here and there if ne needed. Um, and in my opinion, for a owner of an aircraft, TBO is a, it's just a good reference benchmark. Mm. Um, when stuff starts going bad and you're past TBO, um, that's a good indication that uh, you might want to get a really good professional opinion before trying to extend the life of that engine. That's not saying that engine lives will last beyond TBO. I know many guys that have had engines that didn't make it to TBO because of poor operations on that engine. That's really what it boils down to. Mm. The more the aircraft flies, the more that engine runs, the less wear uh, it's going to have from sitting, which is, that sounds weird, but the more inactive an aircraft is, the worse off it is. Um, yeah. When you have a flight school aircraft that flies five, six, seven, eight hours a day, then it doesn't have time to rust. And so you mm -hmm. can go, you, it constantly is going to maintain a layer of oil where all the metal parts aren't supposed to touch and uh, protect that from your startups and your shutdown, which is really where you start losing your engines is startup shutdown fatigue. Um, so yeah, personally, I feel like TBO is a reference point that the manufacturer has set that if you think about it, they're going to protect themselves and make sure that it's reasonable, but probably not as close to the actual potential life the engine can have as possible. Yeah. That's kind of what I, what I've told uh, pilot owners that have come to me about it is just keep an eye on it. You know, right. Uh, as long as you're flying it often enough that it's not going to have problems. And sure. you can, you can do top overhauls and take it beyond TBO. Uh, Absolutely. If, if it's really concerning to you, then, you know, start looking for another engine, I guess, or send yeah. it to the manufacturer for a full overhaul. But Right. Yeah, and even, even times of uh, inactivity, as long as you like even pickle the engine, uh, which is mm -hmm. very inexpensive to do. Um, I mean, most shops will do it for less than 500 bucks uh, to fill it with preservative oils, to remove the plugs, put some inert plugs in and um, put some preservative oil in the cylinders. It's very cheap to pickle and then pull it back out when you're not using it, but it's mm -hmm. very much worth it. So, yeah. well, cool. Uh, that totally sidetracked us from my, what I was originally going to start the stream off with, which is what inspired you to do aviation, uh, both as a pilot and a mechanic. Uh, so, um, honestly, my earliest experience with aviation had to do with uh, a field trip to an airport. I feel like a lot of individuals that don't have family members directly connected to aviation, um, other than just a passing interest or something, it, it kind of sort of stemmed from a visit, uh, someone they ran into, a contact, and that was what it was for me. Uh, so around seven years old, we took a homeschool field trip out to our local airport here in Middle Tennessee, Mike 54, Lebanon, and, uh, Got to walk through a EAA hangar with a bunch of guys that just had tons of experience, even back then uh, in aviation, just modern, current, the cutting edge stuff. They were doing it. And uh, then they were turning around and giving back to us and, and kind of explaining careers in aviation and uh, the path. And I knew right then that's what I wanted to do. Um, I think he had a, a Texan uh, with a smoke kit on it that he uh, flew and demonstrated for us that day, uh, kind of doing some aerobatics there at the airport. And I was hooked. Like I immediately knew what I wanted to do. So I got a flight sim, started playing around with it. We got RC aircraft, remote controlled aircraft. I started doing some of that. Uh, and then eventually I uh, turned 15, decided that I, I wanted to pursue this. Uh, and I have a a brother and I that uh, mowed yards for a living uh, there at a, a very young age. I say for a living, we had like four yards. It's something on the side, something for fun. It was more of a discipline training thing for us, uh, managing contacts, managing a job, something my dad sort of taught us to do from a very, very early age. And um, yeah, so I'd saved up some money and I wanted to get flying lessons. So I went back to the airport and lo and behold, the guy whose hangar I went into uh, those years before was instructing there. Uh, so he and I did our flight lessons together. We're still good friends. I saw him the other day. I think I'm going to get a chance to go fly in his amphibious lake uh, here in the next cool. few weeks. So good That'd times there. Fun. But it started out young and then um, 
I, I realized soon after I started adding my ratings, I bought a aircraft off of eBay of all places. Uh, got my private instrument in it. Uh, and then back then you had to have a complex aircraft for your commercial rating. So I did it in the, the aero. Um, and I realized that my goals, which were to go overseas and be an aviation missionary flying in remote regions of, uh, the, the location I was looking at was Papua New Guinea. I had to have an AMP to do that. And so that's really where my background as a mechanic started is I began researching the options for getting that AMP. Um, I like the idea of doing a internship or an apprenticeship, whatever you want to call that. Uh, but it just, for me, there was no good options around here that could work with me to do that. So fortunately, I was close to one of the, I think there's only 17 um, four-year colleges that you can also get an aircraft uh, or an AMP license, airframe and power plant license at. And one of them is just about an hour down the road, the one that I currently work at. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get an academic scholarship to go there. Um, and I, I felt like for me, there are other options. There's two year schools out there, which crank out great mechanics. But for me with the academic scholarship and, uh, I really was entering college right out of high school. So there was no rush for me to go on and do that two year school, like either a career change or somebody that just wants to go straight into the industry. It just made more sense in my scenario to go get a bachelor's degree and my AMP at the same time. Um, and then as soon as I graduated, moved overseas, flew for a year in Papua New Guinea and helped out that mis uh, ministry that was there. Uh, then came back and worked as a mechanic now at MTSU, got my IA through that experience, which was awesome. Uh, and it ended up teaching because I realized that as much as I love flying, as much as I love doing maintenance, uh, I loved teaching and I loved transferring knowledge uh, and really actually not just transferring knowledge, but just learning with the students. Uh, I cannot tell you the times that as a flight instructor or teaching a 147 class back when I did that, now the professional pilot classes, um, just teaching the material, I see more connections than I did when I went through it or when I was even preparing to do it. So um, it's been really, really rewarding uh, to see students learn, grow, and it's something that I've kind of got addicted to. So I'm planning on making a career out of it. Well, I think that kind of really uh, shines a light on why you started your YouTube channel then. I, I mean, I, I fall into the same category as someone who really just enjoys the teaching. And as, as many of the people who've helped me along my journey to my AMP have said, your AMP is just a license to learn. You know, I'm, I'm learning every single day just by answering questions of people who comment on my videos and say like, Hey, sure. where, where can I go? What, what's the best pathway? And, and a lot of that is subjective. It's, it's based on where you are in life and where you're looking to go. But I have learned so much more in the last year and a half, two years that I've had my license than I did in the seven years building up to getting my license. And right. I mean, I was, I was doing all kinds of stuff back then. Uh, I, t I definitely relate to your buying an airplane on eBay of all places. Uh, my, my best friend and I from the military who got me really into actually affordably flying, he and I, we buy ultralight projects, uh, part 103 projects, and we fix them up. And then cool. we, we say we're going we're gonna to sell them eventually. But between the two of us, we have three hangars and eight aircraft of various <laughs> uh, completion levels. Um, gotcha. <laughs> And uh, I mean, I don't think I've paid more than four thousand dollars for an aircraft. And it doesn't include repairs and, and getting sure. it flying again, but uh, you know, actual straight money out of my pocket to get it in hand has never been that much. And it's been a real learning experience for even the maintenance side of it because I'm working on tube and fabric, wood and fabric, uh, wooden composite, you know, two strokes, small four strokes, and you know, Wow. It's, it's been a really fun journey and, and I try to document it for YouTube and then eventually post it. But I, I have so much fun learning about it and, and uh, just 
getting things working again that I forget most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And to kind of speak to that just a little bit, um, really, I didn't want to start a YouTube channel. I didn't set up to do that. But we had a scenario where we were looking for um, a videos from industry representatives uh, for a Young Eagles, like a, a, a Boy Scouts of America merit badge. Mm -hmm. And so I took the time to do the very first video on my channel, which funny enough has been my most popular one, A Day in the Life of an Aircraft Mechanic. And I loaded that onto YouTube after I made it because they said it was, uh, you know, it was great. It was informative. I shot it with like a crummy iPhone and it was horrible audio. And I look back on it now and think one of these days I need to redo that entire video because it's just it's poor quality. But one of the things that I found uh, for me is that I have I, I don't even want to call it an ability, but a lot of my stuff when I'm teaching or trying to convey information. I try to just tell a story and that's what I'm doing with my 140 project right now is just trying to tell this story and simultaneously teaching when I can in it. And I have thoroughly enjoyed it. It's a pain to do editing. It's I've learned a ton about Premiere Pro and other stuff that I didn't know existed until a couple of years ago when I started all this, um, which really makes me respect the people that have some high quality channels out there uh, that and spend the time, the effort, the money to get it looking good. But for me, it's not about growing or, or any of that. It's more along the lines of getting the opportunity to do what I love and to share that. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the channel Smarter Every Day uh, with Destin, but that I kind of want to be like that for aviation. Like just pick a topic and go explore it. Like right now I'm working on a vortex generator video and I've got an oil systems video that I'm working on. I've just got all these ideas, all these things that I'm, I'm going through, not just sharing like a vlog style maintenance on an aircraft, which is great. Uh, but I also just want to share what I learn while I'm learning it and pass it on for anybody else to learn. So yeah, it's been yeah, fun. I, I've been, I've been scripting ever since I started the, the, the script and the video for the 147 changes, I've been working on scripting out and just learning about each section of the new ACS and kind of trying to fit because there's tons of study videos out there that's just reading the question answers from the prep right. books. But I feel like if you understand, if you truly can understand the, the concepts under those questions and those proficiencies they're looking for in that ACS, you don't need to know the question answers. You can infer that information from the question. And so I, I, I'm working on putting together scripts for each section and each subsection to try to give a, give a different perspective and a different way for people to learn about the, the concepts within the new ACS nice. instead of just the question answer. And I've learned so much from that. It's just sure. insane how much you can learn when you really start to dig down into it. And, oh, and all yeah. the information is free. It's all on the FAA's website. Every every piece of documentation you need is right there. Although the DRS makes it a little difficult. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I do not like that new system. No. Yeah, it's it's been a pain in my butt, especially since most I only have one computer uh, and my son uses it for video games most of the time. And so I'm always on my mobile devices trying to access DRS and it just doesn't like mobile devices at all. <laughs> Not at all. Especially if you're trying to find uh, any um, any stuff relating to like aircraft, uh, like any um, STCs or, or anything. Yeah, like ADs. That. When ADs I was doing my AD research, I literally had to come back to the house, uh, leave the hangar, leave the airstrip, come back home and sit down on a laptop where I could type. Because it was it was impossible to to search anything and actually be able to figure out what was going on at the hangar. Uh, you know it's bad when the FAA is publicizing a whole seminar about how to use DRS. Right. <laughs> I saw that recently. I was like, oh, so they've admitted it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Not user friendly. It's a great way no. of putting it. Yeah. So. Uh, we kind of touched on what led you to begin teaching is you kind of just, you got fell into really 
enjoying the, the process of learning while you, you teach. Um, so you, you touched on, uh, you did 147 classes for a while and now you're doing uh, pilot, professional pilot classes. Uh, right. What, what kind of, did you just kind of fall into the 147 stuff? So there's a backstory there. Uh, after I got my bachelor's, I went back and did my master's. While I was employed at MTSU, I was able to enroll and do a master's in aviation safety and security. So I studied a lot of uh, airport security, a lot of air, uh, aviation safety from an airline perspective, uh, and did some research, some statistics. I uh, got to work with a lot of cool individuals across the, really across the northwestern or the northern hemisphere here uh, in North America, uh, from Canada down to the Caribbean, and researching 147 human factors is really what I focused on for my thesis. Um, but in the process of doing that, like I never wanted to teach. I wanted to get that degree and possibly go work as a uh, ramp agent or a security individual at our local Class Charlie or uh, International Airport. And it ended up kind of falling in my lap that I could have got a 50% tuition reimbursement slash discount, uh, as well as a stipend for teaching one class as a graduate teaching assistant or GTA. Uh, so what I ended up doing was uh, enrolled, taught one 4,000 level senior AMT class uh, on, uh, I think the first one was electronics. So we built our buzz box uh, in that class, as well as, I think we also talked about like pressurization and oxygen systems. I just, I loved it. The class was well set up by the professor who I worked with um, and I pursued it fully, but because there was a time and seat requirement, and a few other minor things. I was fully qualified to be both a professional pilot professor and a AMT professor. And I saw it as more advantageous to do the flight side of things and bring my maintenance background into that program than it would be to do the maintenance side of things and be my operations and bring the operations side of things into that program. Um, while learning to operate in taxi and manipulate aircraft during run-ups and stuff is important, it's just not as necessary or it's not as needed a skill in that program right now as understanding recent uh, systems um, is. So it's been really good. I just finished up a private pilot ground school type uh, class, professional pilot one. And in it, we spent every bit of a month on recent systems for private students. And it wasn't just, you know, this is, a light coming engine. We went down into it. And uh, one of the exercises that I made them do was trace a drop of fuel from the time it leaves the fuel nozzle till the time it's exhausted out the exhaust pipe. What system, what does that system look like? Uh, what, what does it go through in the tanks? What are the probes look like? What are, what are they? Are they capacitor style probes? Are they float style probes? Uh, how does the fuel shut off work? Um, it just made them think about stuff because in my opinion, understanding systems is one of the biggest things that I didn't have when I came through my private pilot's training because my instructor didn't know it either, not to the level that an AMP would. And now that I know it, I cannot tell you the times where I've recognized a problem before it started to occur and was able to catch it. So that's a really long story to say that I started out because it was financially beneficial to teach. I got tuition discount. But then I realized that I really enjoyed doing it. There was an opportunity and I'm very fortunate at, you know, just a few years out of school and then a year directly out of my graduate degree to find a full fledged uh, university that's accredited and everything and be able to step into a tenure track position there. It's been great. That sounds awesome. I, I, my, I worked at a flight school for a little while. Um, over, a, over the summer last year, uh, parted ways, not because I didn't like the school, but their head mechanic was um, not necessarily a people person. I'll, I'll leave it. I'll, I'll, sure. I'll, I'll, uh, I won't elaborate as, too much further on that. But <laughs> yeah, As is a lot of people that are in aviation that are older than 50 or 60, you know, the glory mm -hmm. gold days of six digit, fi six digit figures for airliners and stuff like that is it's just gone. And so you'll yeah. get the crotchety old mechanics and it's, it's all right. I've had my fair share too. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll just say that school has lost four mechanics and a fueler and a front desk guy in the last year because this mechanic can't play well in the sandbox with others. Wow. But I really enjoyed the the flights the flight instructors that worked there and every one of their students. I encouraged them to bring them into the hangar when they were learning the stuff about the the engines and and I'd walk them through it and kind of say this is you know this is what this part actually is this is what it does you know this is the the journey that this that this component takes and and what what really uh, I I really enjoyed just just breaking it down to and and seeing the 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 light switch flip that sure. says uh, hey I finally understand why the airplane does this you know. And, and how that system yeah. affects what the airplane is doing while you're flying. It's fun. Man, that's fun. Uh, well, we really just, we've breezed through everything I wanted to talk to just in normal, uh, in conversation. This is what happens when you get people who know how to tell a story, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I just like talking about airplanes. Hey, you know, who doesn't? <laughs> so... Uh, you kind of touched on this as well. Uh, being a mechanic helps piloting. Uh, sure. But the operations side, you would say, is not so uh, beneficial for the mechanic. to, uh, or, or would you say it kind of goes both ways? It definitely goes both ways. My, my statement was that in the 147 program, we didn't have a ton of aircraft that we taxied around that we operated. We had mm -hmm. test sales. We had aircraft, but they were very stationary. Um, I mean, we typically, if we're running our 147 aircraft, we got them tied down, uh, tied down, chalked, parking brake on, uh, somebody holding onto the strut if we could safely do that, which I, uh, we never would. But basically, we, we just didn't want to move them. It was too big of a risk. Uh, the safety uh, factor for someone who's not a competent, every day is working on airplanes and, and actually has had experience running them, the few times a semester there was an opportunity, we may or may not have somebody that had a even a, a private pilot's license there to to do that with them. So it was too much risk for a uh, 147 instructor to allow seven different engines with seven different teams to be running. Um, so I felt like that operational knowledge that I had wasn't going to benefit these individuals. Because when you get in the industry, if you get on engine group and you have to go do run-ups or you have to go do ops checks, stuff like that, more than likely you're going to be trained on that aircraft by whoever is employing you or they're going to take you with them several times before you do it by yourself. So I felt like the information I was going to give them, they were going to have to relearn anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so just the length of time, the in-seat time, going pro pilot was half the teaching hours that I had to teach. Uh, because of 147 requirements to teach the exact same number of classes. So ju just honestly, it was easier to do the pro pilot side of things. And it made more sense to me to give that maintenance knowledge to those guys than ops knowledge to maintenance. Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess that, that definitely makes, uh, makes sense. I, I definitely, I, as someone who's just all about aviation in general, I, I have a hard time separating the maintenance and the operational knowledge most of the time. And normally they aren't. It's yeah. just, but I feel like that it just made more sense to go that route, but yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, and it's something that uh, made me laugh when I was doing my transition from uh, military aviation to civilian, I went through a, a kind of um, crash course to be able to uh, take the writtens and orals. And uh, some of the guys I went through it with had never touched aircraft before the military and were just getting the AMP so that they could have a certificate when they left. Wow. And, uh, we got to the parts about, you know, um, properly repairing a wood spar or uh, <laughs> wood aircraft construction. And they're like, there's no screws or nails in this. It's all glue. I said, yeah. <laughs> they're like, how does that stay together? Make sure you have a hanger. That's how it stays yeah. together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and it was just fun because they, they don't have a lot of that operational knowledge that I had gained through, you know, my one, sure. my 103 experience and, and uh, my other P 
p private pilot experience too. I, I don't have my certificate, but I do have several hours in in airplanes, and I live on an airport, which means every time yeah. someone flies in and I'm home, I go out and ask for a chance to go up in it. <laughs> <laughs> I got to fly uh, a 210 for a little while, which is pretty cool. They flew in. And, nice. Uh, it's a good airframe. I, yeah. I had fun. It was, it was interesting. Uh, I, I was task saturated coming in to land. And so he operated the gear for me, uh, take off, take off and land. And I was like, wow, the difference with gear up and gear down is insane. How, how draggy yeah. it feels. Right. And it, I had never drawn that conclusion because everything I had was, you know, fixed gear. Yeah. Right. And, uh, so it's just been really interesting to be able to draw those conclusions and, and really connect the dots with my maintenance knowledge of how those systems work and, and what it feels like behind the controls of each of these airplanes. Yeah, absolutely. I wish I wish that 147, I, I'm really hoping that the, the changes to the 147 program will, will allow for programs like yours to be able to, to spend some more time on, on some things because uh, I feel like there's a lot of mechanics out here in the in the industry that say that guys who come out of these 147 schools are really lacking in a lot of the the, the um, necessary skills for like working in an airline. And, right. and sometimes I feel that way too. Like I, honestly, I feel like the the pipelines from uh, that that like Delta Airlines and things like are are currently opening are the better option for someone who just wants to go straight to the airlines because right. it's almost a different skill set. It's, sure. it's very much uh, all written out for you. Uh, you go, you get your work order, and you take it. You complete the task. You check off every step, and then you write. Uh, you send it off on its way. And in general aviation or uh, smaller operations, it's a little bit different. It's it's more uh, placing the responsibility on the mechanic themselves and, and the troubleshooting that's required uh, for a GA mechanic versus a, uh, a airline mechanic is different. And yeah. I see a lot of people in, on AMP forums complaining about fresh guys out of 147 schools who don't know anything. And I'm just like, you have to realize a lot of these schools are two years or, or shorter sometimes, and Absolutely. they don't have time to do anything except cram you full of knowledge to pass the test. Right. So. That's what's unfortunate is the way it, in my opinion, that it's set up right now, especially for GA. Uh, getting your AMT or your AMP aircraft maintenance technician's license or your airframe and power plant license, which are really synonymous. The AMP is the official word for it, obviously. But getting that license to do it, you have to have knowledge about everything. Uh, there's a base level knowledge about everything that you need to understand you need to know whether you're working on a piper cub or a 747 um to to be honest the people that work on 747s probably not all of them are amps they just they have a repair station certificate they work for this repair station they do one thing or they repel uh they just replace a part and so they follow the immediate steps to do that and so those guys i'm not downplaying that at all i'm just saying that the skill set that they are looking for is not the exact same skill set that the FA written exams at OMP is cranking out for mm -hmm. mechanics. So yeah. there is a disparity there. I do feel like one of the main ways to make that transition, if you are looking to go airlines, uh, is networking. It's 100% networking. It's not about what you know and how well you did on a test or an OMP. It's who you know. And so being able to... For me, at a four-year university, which probably has a little bit more of a network connection than your average uh, just two-year university, I could have gone FedEx, Delta, or American right out of school. Or if I wanted to do a feeder, I could have gone Embraer uh, and a few other ones as well. So there were options out there for me that I just simply turned down because it's not what I was interested in. Um, so being able to establish a good connection with either that feeder route or the major that you want to go to, that's huge. That That's where it's at because they will train you to what you need to know. Yeah. I, and I, I totally agree. I, I have over the last couple of years started going to more and more aviation conferences and events and networking. And 
uh, I went to the Northwest Aviation Conference this last year, and I cannot count the number of job offers I got just because I had my certificates from yeah, companies all absolutely. over. Yeah, uh, I had like four different companies in Alaska offering me a job. I had Mainline's offering me a job. I networked with the the CFO for Hillsborough Aero, uh, Hillsborough Aero Academy, which is a huge flight school for rotor and fixed wing, and they have a great AMP program. Uh, and they awesome. just opened up uh, a feeder for their AMPs to be able to get their their licenses uh, at a huge discount. Um, oh, that's and awesome. I reached out to him just recently because I'm looking for uh, someone who knows a fresh. CFI who'd be willing to relocate for a year to my airport because I've got 10, 15 people who are looking to get their licenses, but the nearest flight schools are two hours away. Um, and so it, it really is all about who you know and, and who you can talk to. And, and, and I, I mean, I turned down a job at Boeing when I exited the military because it, while it was going to be good paying great benefits, it wasn't what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to work on little bug smashers. I wanted to go get the $25 an hour job at the flight school and, and drive two hours each way to, to work for $25 an hour, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it was, that, that was the experience I was looking for and it opened up a lot of doors for me. So I, mean, I, I, I try to impress that upon everyone who talks to me about aviation maintenance and, and where to go. And, uh, anyone who shoots me an email that wants help looking for a place to go, I've, I've, I've helped place several people uh, with flight schools or, uh, you know, big uh, like Duncan Aviation's program or uh, Delta. And it, it's just because I, I talk to those people who are in charge of those programs and I say, hey, this guy's really interested, you know, and then I send that guy off and say, you make the connection yourself, you know, right. you go talk to them. I've let them know you're interested. It's on you now. And I've, got a couple people already who've, who've messaged me back and said, Hey, I just want to let you know, I have a job now That's in awesome. aviation and I'm, I'm working towards my certificates, both AMP and pilot. And I'm like, wow, that's, that, that is what I started this channel for is to help people get, get to where they wanted to be in aviation and, and really m expand their own networks. Yeah. That's rewarding. Yep. see so what what advice do you have for future mechanics i mean we've we've kind of just been throwing all that advice out already anyway uh, throughout the whole sure. stream but <laughs> so i will share what my 147 instructor told me on uh, during my we have like a capstone course uh and we have a, a tool program to where you can get like discount snap-on tools or mac tools in a box if you wanted and so we were always discussing tools and stuff. And he, one of the last lectures preps that he did was he pulled an ink pen out and he laid it on the desk and really was talking about something else, just laid it there. And then he transitioned to this discussion about what's the most important tool or most versatile tool in your toolbox. And so we were all kicking around ideas. You know, a torque wrench is probably one of the more important ones because it needs to be calibrated. You need it for basically everything in the field. And he shot it down and said, now that thing's useless, uh, which caught us off guard. And he was, he was trying to prove a point, which is why he said what he said. And so when it got down to it, we were all like, well, I have no earthly idea. Like, we're over here guessing screwdrivers and, you know, like it's stuff that I, I don't think this is it. But apparently you're about to shed some wisdom on us right here. And he picked up that ink pen and said, this ink pen can determine whether or not a flight can go or it's down. Mm -hmm. And it is also what can determine your future in the aviation maintenance field. You can get in trouble with this ink pen or you can make a great career and a living with this ink pen. And he told a great story that I won't share here for sake of time, but basically that impressed upon me, not just the, you know, there's all this knowledge stuff that we have to know, but the responsibility and the liability that comes with an AMP and especially an IA, um, all of that uh, stuff that you learn, being able to go home at night, lay your head down on a pillow and, and 
feel okay about what you've done. That's what he was driving at. Do quality work. Don't be afraid to question something and don't be afraid to push back on a on an owner that's pushing you to sign something off just because they don't want to replace aileron control cables that look worn out. Mm-hmm. So it was it was a very, very, very good discussion. And the other thing which ties back into what we've already said, uh, even when you're a student, go ahead and have a, a you don't have to have 10,000 of these, but have a semi-professional looking business card made up a hundred of them at the most if you if that's all you need and be actively going places talking to people and be capable of giving them a card that says you've thought about what you're wanting to do you want to make a career out of this if you if you are interested in doing that and being willing to before you're qualified put yourself out there because you will be surprised at the people that will take that initiative that you're showing and let it flow into a job when you're qualified. So mm-hmm. that those two items, they're unrelated, it, it seems like, to what we would teach in 147 type scenarios. But the amazing responsibility that comes with an AMPIA, as well as the, uh, the networking, kind of like we've already discussed, sort of try to broaden your horizons, broaden who you know, and don't be willing to take a job that you know you could go somewhere else and make more. I love that you brought up the fact of making 20 bucks an hour working at the airport. Um, I, I think my first flight instructing gig was $15 an hour. Uh, I remember days, weeks that I got a paycheck for one tenth of an hour because of weather. And so, you know, it was more expensive to cut the check than it was to just wait relative to next week's pay. Uh, but that led to stuff that led to stuff. And within a decade of that time, now I'm working at a university as a professor, teaching kids and, and still really enjoying what I do. And I think that's really the key thing that I try to impress on on new mechanics, too, is, is yes, the, the money's there. You know, top out pay at major airlines and at, at cargo airlines is like $60 an hour and climbing right now. Uh, yeah. But it's really not about chasing the dollar unless that's really what you want to do. Exactly. It's about finding where you fit in the industry and, and enjoying your time there and really just passing that down to the next generation. Because I think, I really think that the mechanic shortage that we've had isn't due to pay. It's not due to economy. It's due to the fact that so many people were so burnt by the industry they, they pursued it for the money and not for the passion of it. And, Cause the, the best instructors I've ever had were the ones that, you know, volunteered at the air races or uh, helped out with the, the museums for no pay or, or the guy who's been wrenching in his own hangar for 30 plus years. You know, he's, he's a skeptical guy, but he knows what he's talking about and he enjoys what he does every single day. And those are the guys that I learned from the most is just the ones that found where they wanted to be and got there and, and grew from that. And absolutely. Yeah. And I totally agree that reaching out before you're even qualified is key. Cause I've uh, a lot of the, I send out, I sent out little postcards uh, per Michael's recommendation from Phalanx. Uh, it says, Hey, uh, here's a 20% discount off your first service. I'm an AMP, but I'm not qualified with my IA, so I can't do your annuals for another year or so. But if you have any like owner assisted maintenance, oil changes, anything you have questions about, call me. I'm willing to drive to you and I'll work with you. I'll bring my tools. I'll show you what I know. And then we can build that relationship. And when they're ready for an annual after I've got my IA, I'm going to be the first person they think of. You know, yeah, the, the absolutely. Out to them and said, "Hey, let's work together. Sure, let's, let's educate you on your airplane so you're more comfortable where you're sitting." Yeah, that's key too. And uh, let's see, would you change anything you did to get your ratings? Like, would you have gone for your AMP first and then your your pilot's license, or you think you you? Uh, I'm happy with what I did. Time wise, yeah. obviously, I feel like I would have learned more if I'd have waited, but I had my commercial rating before I had my AMP. 
So, Mm -hmm. and I did all my part 61. So I'd built 500, 600 hours by the time I graduated with my AMP. So I felt like I was safe as I was going through all of those things. I felt like I understood systems. Okay. It was just the, and I'll give an example of it. You know, we talk about magnetos in ground school for private pilot and how they're a self-contained AC generator and they create a spark. Uh, You've got your dual magnetos by regulation. We talk about the things themselves, but as a private pilot, I could see a case. I could see a magneto, but I could not visualize the internal components of that magneto. When I got my AMP, I could see down to the cotter pin holding the drive nut on the gear of the backside of that mag all the way through the primaries and secondary coils, the capacitor, the both sets of points, if it had them, the impulse coupling, there was a depth of knowledge that it wasn't just because I knew it. It was because I practically had taken apart one and put it back together and figured out a problem with them. And I would say that level of information, especially kind of coinciding with getting my commercial was huge. Um, There's been scenarios where I couldn't answer a problem with knowledge uh, just because I didn't know what I needed to, but there's been a ton of times where I, you know, I've had a Bendix get hung up on a starter before and just instantly shut it down because I knew what was going on. Got out, pulled the end of the starter off, replaced it with a new one, kicked myself for not lubricating it with uh, the uh, silicone spray and, and then just went on. And so it was, you know, just learning experiences like that. So. Yeah. And, and, I mean, I, I, I would definitely have not done my pathway different either, I don't think. I mean, I, I went the military route. I did six years active duty working on Chinooks. Uh, I've said it a million times on my channel before. Uh, I did a 12-month stint over in Afghanistan that allowed me to buy my amazing house here on the airport uh, where I have a hangar and the ability to, to see people flying in on a beautiful day like today, I've got my window open for the natural light, but it's also because the runway is just off to my right hand side. Oh, that's here, awesome. And I can see the airplanes as they come in. And uh, I've, I've had so many opportunities that I would never have had if I hadn't gone the way that I did. And yeah, I, I do recommend 147 schools for people who are in a situation where 147 school works for. Sure. Yeah. Um, it, if if you're like, I had someone ask me the other day if I thought that joining the military was a good route. And I, I said, yes, it is. If you are ready for the sacrifices that come with a military education right. and the service. Uh, I've had somebody else who jumped in and, and uh, got upset at someone else in the comments because they were, uh, putting down 147 schools and uh, he's like, well, I had to go 147 because I only, it was the only option I had that fit my family, family situation. I needed to be home to be a caregiver for my, for my disabled family member and uh, going and working in apprenticeship didn't allow me the money that I needed. And I had the free time to do the 147 courses and in my off time and so it's really it all it's all situational and yeah uh, and that's the big question is always is it worth it and it, the a- big answer is always maybe <laughs> right <laughs> you know yeah. but however you get there is always dependent on how you uh, how you look at it and and your mindset going into it I think yeah there's a hundred different ways to get into aviation and that's what's beautiful about it you know. If you're interested, you could show up at the airport and just walk in and tell somebody, hey, I'm, I'm interested in learning to fly. And I have never been in this scenario to where someone wasn't willingly giving information or telling you, you need to talk to this person. You need to talk to this person. Aviation has a familial like spirit or a kindred, almost like a, a fraternal brotherhood uh, with the men and women that have done what you want to do. And want to reach back and give you a hand and pull you along. That's part of why I do what I do on this channel. Um, it yeah. would be way easier just to do maintenance without recording it, and putting it out there to get scrutinized and viewed. Um, but I love to share what I'm doing, uh, whether it's with someone one-on-one individual, which I've done, 
with a classroom of 80 kids, which I'm doing, or filming, installing and removing a magneto three times while I try to figure out why it's not functioning correctly, like I've had no. to do on the 140. Yeah, I, I actually, I still kick myself over this one I, when I was working at the flight school. I had only ever timed a magneto uh, before in, in in my AMP crash course. And I had my timing pin in and I had put it into the aircraft and I turned the propeller with the pin. Oh, on. no. <laughs> that just makes me cringe. <laughs> oh, it was, it was the worst experience. Luckily, uh, a buddy of mine who uh, has his AMPIA but decided he was better off only doing magneto rebuilds. That's all he does for a living now. It's just magneto rebuild. I called him up. I said, hey, I've got a magneto I screwed up. I, I bent the pin inside of it. We got it out. I need you to take it apart and make sure it's good. Make sure I didn't just destroy it. And he, yeah. he's like, oh, yeah, there's a tiny scratch, but you're good. And I was like, oh, I'm still kicking myself over that, you know? It's sure. ridiculous. Yeah. But, uh, you know. Th- no, but the most I memorable just, learning experiences are mistakes. And it mm-hmm. is for me, too, uh, upside and maintenance. I, I've been there, man. I think everyone has. Yeah. And the the thing about those is they can almost paralyze you to where you're not willing to risk something and do something you're not 100% sure of anymore because you don't want the embarrassment or the sheer, you know, frustration uh, that that brings. And that's that's a danger, in my opinion. You need to mm-hmm. be willing to try and not not try in a sense that you're going to do it, not knowing if it's a successful outcome, try in a sense that you're going to seek out instruction, seek out guidance, whether that's an individual or a document, and you're going to do it and test it, make sure it's done correctly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll tell you the next three magnetos I installed, I had my <laughs> eye over my shoulder. I was like, Hey, I know, I know what to do, but I want right. you to make sure that I don't like absent mindedly forget something. And yeah. from that point on, I was, you know, I, I can time and and install a magneto practically in my sleep at this point because I, I, I wanted to make sure that I could do it properly after screwing up that one time, and I'll never forget that one screw up. But it sure has made me a better mechanic. And sure, sure. Uh, I, I'm kind of jealous of you living out there by Lebanon Airport because that's a beautiful airport. I, I've I've been out that way a few times. So. Did you, uh, and I, I know this is guessing in a long stab, when you did your crash course, did you do Baker's uh, for the AMP? I did, yeah. I, so yeah. I did, a, I did a, my first, I did two crash courses. Uh, the first one was uh, with South Seattle Sound College over here on the West Coast. Okay. And I didn't end up, uh, I wasn't confident enough in the information that was shoved into my brain during that time. Uh, so sure. I didn't end up taking my tests. I had my 8610 and everything signed. Wow. But I, I didn't take my test. And so I went overseas. And after I got back from overseas, about six months later, I said, you know what, screw it. I'm going to Baker's. And I went I went out there. Uh, there happened to be uh, a uh, fly, one of their fly-in barbecues uh, that the chapter out there puts on while I was out. Oh, there. yeah. So I had my yep, little that's... handheld radio in my in my hotel room and I was listening to the air traffic while I was studying. And <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I've uh, I'm pretty actively involved with that EAA group as just a member. I'm not a, a on the board or anything like that, but it's a great EAA group out there. It's, we meet in the same hangar that it all started for me in on that field trip. So a lot of good memories, a lot of good vibes at a, at that airport. We just one of our members, uh, Sam Swick, just won the Reno Air Races in his division last year. So oh, one right. of our most recent one of our most recent meetings was him discussing that with his aircraft in there and just kind of giving some information about the Reno air races. Yeah. I'm really bummed. I'm not going to make the races this year, uh, considering it's the last one they'll have uh, yeah. at Reno and they don't know sure. where they're going next. Yeah. It's there's, you know, at some point you just have to decide you can't go to everything or do everything. This is my first year going to Oshkosh. Uh, I finally hunkered down and decided to do that. So I'll be at Oshkosh on I think Thursday, Friday is when I'm going. Uh, I'm yeah. just doing two days because I've got some other stuff going on. And so I'm really looking forward to that. But yeah, I thought the same thing. I think tickets are probably going to go for like a hundred times what they normally do just because it's I, the last looked, one at Reno. I looked 
I, I was looking at just getting general admission and then pit passes because I've had a couple of people offer to uh, let me help out on the pits. Um, nice. And it was going to be like three hundred dollars, or oh, almost four hundred dollars, just for a general admission and a pit pass. Uh, wow. And another another hundred and fifty bucks if I wanted a box and a pit pass. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I can't afford that. I can't even take the time <laughs> off. <laughs> oh wow, that's that's crazy. Yeah, and I was gonna try to go to Osh this year too, but uh, I I always end up changing careers right around air show season. <laughs> and I can never take the time off. Yeah, I, I'm excited. Like my the lifestyle that I, and you know, a lot of people ask me, why are you doing teaching? You know, you could go make double what you're making right now in the industry and then come back and teach when you retire. But for me, I want to make a career out of making operators uh, or mechanics, or uh, I want to make people that can go into the industry and be safe, competent, and skilled at what they do uh, that is my career so one of the benefits of that the lifestyle is you know like we were talking about before we came on i just wrapped up my s spring semester and outside of a summer class in june i'm basically free till august and so it's provided opportunities which i can't wait to share on my channel uh, like getting typewriter in a dc3 and working with a, a group of incredible individuals uh, on the world's oldest flying DC-3, uh, getting to do the videos uh, that I do on this channel, getting to work on that 140 flip aircraft, uh, which is my ultimate goal during the summers, um, and just get to be part of aviation again. And everybody makes decisions, and that's one of the reasons I've decided to do what I do. Yeah, yeah, and I've had the same conversations with people. Like, I live two hours away in either direction from a major uh, from a major airport, a uh, major international airport, either Portland right. or Seattle. I could go there right now. I could go get in on, with Alaska, Delta, Southwest, whoever I wanted to, and and make a lot of money. Or I can continue to help pilots and help other mechanics and and work with my tiny little towns uh, career pathways program and try to, you know, help bring aviation to a community with an airport. I mean, we have a, a 2000 foot airport here, a 2000 foot runway here with a 300 foot displacement, but it's, it's got an easement to the neighborhood where I live in. So there's taxiways and there's lots of people that fly in. Oh, and we cool. live so we live so close to major aviation hubs that this is the perfect place to introduce kids to aviation at an early age so that they can get those make those connections and and get an earlier start right uh, I just went to the uh, advisory meeting for the CT, the C, CTE program for my uh, school district in my little town. And I invited the AOPA representative for their pathways program and he pitched their pathways program, which I actually didn't know had a mechanic pathway. Really? So, yeah. It's, so it's got uh, pilot drones and mechanics. Uh, they don't really publicize it because it's the pilots association. But when he was giving the pitch, he was saying that they have a mechanics pathway for this as well. And uh, you know, if a kid gets into this in in ninth grade and they come work, they want to take the mechanic pathway and they come help me through high school. And by the time they graduate from high school, they've got their maintenance experience requirement. That's and they awesome. Can get their AMP, or you know, I we, they can get their their private pilot's license done. Uh, you know, and if they get started even before that, they can get their glider rating at the soaring the soaring club that's just down like two hours away you know it, it, i live in a, a beautiful place to, to be able to really help with education and, and that's that's i'd rather make less and help more than make more and not have the time or energy to help because i feel that's like awesome. a lot of the guys that do work these higher paying jobs they get so burnt out at the end of the day that they, they don't have the energy to really help others. 
Yeah. And sure, I agree. So do you have any questions for me? I think we kind of story told our way through all the ones I came up with. So. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, just for because this will probably turn into a post stream video on my channel, which is terrible because of this allergies that I've got. I sound literally a full octave lower than what I normally sound. But anyways, uh, for my viewers, the people who ramble into an hour long <laughs> video loaded onto my channel, what could they expect to see on uh, remote AMT as far as the content? What do you what do you have coming up? Uh, what do you have maybe as a last thing for them uh, to come over and check out some of your stuff on your channel? So as I mentioned earlier in the stream, uh, I don't know if they want to dig through the first 30 minutes or so, but I have a video coming out on the changes to how the testing process is going to be uh, right. when the new ACS comes out for, or when the new ACS is fully implemented next in July. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping to have that published within the next week. Uh, most of my other content really talks about the different ways you can make your way through your AMP certificates, uh, what what to expect in the industry. Um, I've got shorts out about the pay scales, and I try to update those every time I see a new pay scale come out, but you just can't stay on top of that. I must say, that's going to be a daily <laughs> task if you yeah. try that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's hard to stay on top of that one, but I, I do try to keep abreast of that for anyone who comments and asks a question. Awesome. Um, uh, I'm working on a series right now that's going to try to walk through and educate on the different sections and subsections of the new ACS so that people can kind of study their way through, or even if they're uh, a pilot who's interested in what the mechanics might need to know. Uh, the, the conceptual videos are, are in the works. I've got about probably 10 or 15 scripts done. I just need to find the time to actually sit down and, and talk to the camera a little bit. <laughs> oh, yeah, I understand that completely. That's also, awesome. it sounds like your channel is going to become a wealth of knowledge for anybody that wants to be an AMP or anybody that's in the process and needs a little bit more guidance on pursuing that ultimate certificate. And what about you? What what have you got in the works? You, I, you said something about a, a DC three type rating. That's uh, exciting. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, I'm trying to work with the group, but I I had some connections from previous stuff to where I've got the opportunity to this summer do an SIC rating, second in command, and then pursue in the future a PIC piloting command certificate, a captain certificate uh, in a DC three. Um, so we have the flagship Detroit is the world's oldest flying DC-3. It was manufactured uh, March 7, 2nd, 1937, and uh, it's 86 years old this year. We've been to two air shows already, uh, but I kind of came on. I am the youngest guy in the group by like double my age. So the next closest guy is in his early 60s. Um so it's just a really, really cool group of guys that have so much tribal knowledge about aviation, things that we're unfortunately losing because uh, it's not part of an FAA written and it's not part of a 147 training curriculum or even flight program. So I, I'm really having a good time with them, just getting to know them, going to air shows with them. But I'm also hoping I've got some footage of my initial training and, uh, I'm working on putting that together and kind of sharing my journey to becoming captain on a DC-3. Uh, it'll be a several-year process, so hopefully I can share little snippets here and there as we do it. Uh, but one of the things that I would recommend is if, I mean, I'm all about meeting people. So uh, if you go online to flagshipdetroit.org, you can see their schedule and uh, most of the air shows this year I'm going to be at. And so people are more than welcome to come out. And I'll show them around the coolest dc3 or the coolest aircraft that i've ever gotten to fly and uh so that's going to be coming out i've also today i did a full static run up did a static rpm check on my Cessna 140 uh we hit 2050 rpm which is within specs for that engine uh for static uh it looks like the left master cylinder i might have to rebuild um and this annual is taking way longer than anticipated but that's what happens when you don't fly an airplane so Fortunately, I think I'm done. Uh, Going to crank that video out as soon as I can and then sign it off. And uh, here in the next few weeks to a month or so, 
get ready to fly it out for the very first time in almost a decade. Uh, so some exciting stuff for me personally, as well as just some benchmarks that I've set and sort of shot for. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be fun. Oh, it looks like, uh, you've got quite a wealth of knowledge, uh, heading our way on your channel as well. I, I personally, I reached out to you because I really enjoy your storytelling and, and following your journey with the 140 and, and your other videos too have all been just very informative and also enjoyable to watch. And, well, appreciate it. Uh, are you going to be taking the 140 to uh, Bosch this year? Or? I'm not comfortable stretching its legs that much yet. Uh, I've had some issues with the radios in there because I think they came over on the Mayflower. So I'm going to have <laughs> to uh, do something. I think I'm just going to use a handheld, to be honest. It doesn't have ADSB out in it. So I just don't feel comfortable taking it into uh, the world's busiest air show <laughs> without ADSB yeah. with a handheld. <laughs> uh, and I know I'm not going to get the avionics done in time. So I'm driving this year um, and going to stay within a gliding distance ratio to my airport uh, until I'm really comfortable and confident in this engine. Um, and uh, yeah, then hopefully maybe next year it'll be a different story. We'll see what happens. Well, that's exciting. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see what comes of the, the 140 and, and, as you stretch its legs uh, and work out its avionics issues, uh, it's been it's been a really enjoyable journey watching your uh, your content on that 140, and I think your your analytics probably uh, agree with that. <laughs> it's been it's been my most popular stuff uh, that I've got on there, which is funny because initially my thought was I just want to make educational type content, but uh, the the journey of rebuilding a piece of history uh that plane was manufactured in 1947 and it's just it's been amazing to get to revive something that's been around since before orville wright died in 48 so yeah. it, it's pretty incredible well awesome uh i think that pretty much wraps it all up and we came in at just over an hour uh, yeah it was really awesome which is crazy because it doesn't feel like it's been that long no it never does i I think uh, after Michael and I signed off the live stream, we ended up talking another half hour afterwards and he ended up finally <laughs> saying, Hey, I got to go take care of my kid. Uh, it's late. It's late here. <laughs> yeah. Said, oh yeah. I forget. I forget you're, you're uh, over in Colorado. So it's, it's a little later <laughs> there. <laughs> but it's been great. I'm glad you invited me on man. And if nothing else, I've had a great time just sharing some information here. I know it's scattered. There's a lot to it, but um, it's, this is why I love aviation. Just get yeah. to sit down and chat with somebody that otherwise I wouldn't have probably any chance of knowing or talking to. And, uh, we have a common bond, uh, with a wrench in the skies. So. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe I might've actually seen you at that fly in. I, it was, uh, 2021 October. Uh, I was over at Baker's. So might have been. In October. You might've yeah. been there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, oh, I missed a phone call from a from the guy who's A75 I'm rebuilding. He's probably checking in on it. He, I've had it nice. for a couple of months now. So. <laughs> awesome. Well, I wanted to do a giveaway while we were on here, and I have a uh, exactly zero comments or individuals that are watching my side of it right now. I have one. Uh, I have one viewer. Uh, nice. on the screen here and one like that like happens to be the guy who i helped uh do his oil change on uh not long that's ago that's awesome when we talked about before we started the stream so <laughs> well the what i was going to do is i was going to send out a hat that i had made up with my uh youtube logo which is just a gear uh with a headset it kind of blends who i am it's got the flight side of it and the maintenance side of it now, I've got two of those. One of them says the flying mechanic. What I'd love to do is I would love to send both of them to you. And then you just keep one and give one to uh, that other guy as a, uh, as my gratitude for tuning in. And uh, as my way of saying thank you to you for what you're doing for both aviation and, and by uploading content like this and trying to put people together to talk about becoming a mechanic. 
Well, I appreciate it. I will look forward to that package coming in the mail, and I will uh, definitely let him know to expect me to be by his uh, hangar to drop off his hat. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the stream now.